Lord, we indeed just want to echo the words of that song again, Lord. At least one day in your courts and thousands elsewhere. It's good to be in your presence. Lord, as we sung before, Lord, our souls long for your presence, Lord. Lord, so often we try to quench our thirst with other things, Lord, when what we most need is you. Lord, I just thank you as we come to you, Lord, you, you welcome us with open arms. You rejoice to see us, Lord. Lord, to be with you is you, you welcome us into, into a party, Lord God, into a celebration. You're filled with joy. And likewise, Lord, you fill us with your joy too. Thank you, Lord. You should have a sheet looking a bit like this with the uh, Bible passage um, today on. I've got a reduced version of it. If you've not got one there, I think there's some more here. Yeah, there's more here actually. So we've been looking at the last days and the second coming and uh, what a fantastic subject to look at we're in uh, week three out four of looking at some uh, bible passages uh, with regards to that uh, we're looking at specific passages we're not looking at kind of so much of a, an overall theme if you like and trying to bring a, a systematic understanding of exactly what program might happen uh, but more of understanding what different scriptures are bringing to us uh, about this subject and we looked at Matthew and in particular Matthew 24 and 25 you recall a couple of weeks ago and uh, there we looked at what Jesus had to say uh, great place to start on the subject and uh, Jesus of course he, he had to say a couple of things first of all he, he is coming back uh, secondly is that we don't know exactly when and uh, we're not to be deceived uh, by uh, speculation and by people declaring here he is or there he is uh, and such like and that uh, but we're to be ready for when he comes and uh, yeah ready ready and to stand for uh, we then looked in Acts uh, and we looked at both Jesus' ascension and uh, then the message that the apostles declared, which was about uh, Jesus coming a second time as, as judge, uh, that he's going to come in a similar way to how he went. In other words, as he went up on the cloud, he's going to come uh, in some way which is visible to all and uh, we are all going to stand before him as, as judge. And uh, the key thing that uh, is the angels actually indicate to the apostles, they stand there looking into the sky, and uh, the angels say, basically, don't just stand here looking up into the sky, even though he's coming back in that way. Uh, in essence, they say, get on with the job Jesus has given you, which is to go and proclaim the gospel, uh, receive the Holy Spirit, uh, and the message, of course, the apostles take is that Jesus is coming, so repent, be baptized, follow him receive the Holy Spirit. So now we're coming to one of Paul's letters uh, in 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, as I've noted on the sheet, uh, Paul planted the church in Corinth in about AD 51, 52, and uh, he's there for a little while. Uh, and then he writes three years later uh, in response to questions and reports that he has heard. And uh, one of those questions or reports seems to be, are you really sure there's going to be a resurrection because uh, and, and that's a fundamental question actually isn't it for us are we really sure are we really sure that there is going to be a resurrection 
Uh, and in our materialist culture, our materialist age, where we very much focus on what we can see and feel and experience in the here and now, um, that sort of, I'll call it speculation, I'm using that word, you know, I'll use it, is, is, is kind of, it is just pure speculation to people, isn't it? So is it something that's real? Uh, and in our culture today, I mean, what's, what do people think about what happens to people when they die? Uh, and we're very temporal focused, don't we? We focus on this time, this period of time alone. And uh, you sometimes hear about you know, people becoming a, a star in the sky, in, in the words of uh, Lloyd Webber, or, um, or that people linger on in people's memories and they somehow remain alive in people's memories. And that's really interesting, actually, that concept, because when you, if we go back to Greek times, uh, there was different thoughts then as well in terms of what happens when people die. Uh, some people thought that that's just the end, that's it, nothing. Uh, so Epicureans, for example, so they considered that you should just, uh, the aim was just to live a peaceful life on earth for Epicureans, as much peace, as much free of stress as possible, and uh, to live in that way because that's the best way to live life, and uh, then at the end, that's the end, that's it. Uh, others in Greek uh, uh, philosophy uh, considered that there was something after death, uh, in fact, probably the majority thought this, but it was just a kind of a misty existence of a soul which had separated from the body, uh, and that was it. So it was nothing particular to look forward to uh, at all. Um, that, that was basically it. So the key question is, is, are we sure of the resurrection? That's what Paul's answering. The second question is, is, is well, if there is a resurrection, then... Um, our bodies just don't seem to be lined up for that. You know, the, the science of what our bodies are like and the way that we just perish and such like, um, that doesn't seem to line up with resurrection. So Paul's answering those two questions uh, in this passage. And the first one he answers, uh, as uh, you can just see on the screen there, uh, is, well, there is the historical fact. You cannot say that there is no resurrection because the historical fact is, is that Jesus has risen and he's been seen by many, and it's the most important element of the gospel we proclaim. Let's just read it in uh, chapter 15, verse 1. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. By the way, I'm using the New Living Translation, which is a slightly paraphrased form, but it carries through some of the arguments in this section a bit more clearly. So that's why I'm using that, that version. No problem with the NIV whatsoever. Uh, go to the NIV any day. Uh, you welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe that something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what has also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I saw him. I'm not going to read the bit small, uh, so we haven't got too much. So it makes no difference whether I preach or they preach, for we all preach the same message you have already believed. So we say, look, Jesus really died and Jesus really rose again from the dead. There is no doubt in my mind about that whatsoever. We're, there's loads of us who are witnesses of it. Then he moves on to the false teaching. So there are some who say there is no resurrection of the dead. Verse 12. But tell me this. Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead... Why are some of you saying there'll be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the dead, from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you're still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, 
we're more to be pitied than anyone in the world. So it's, it, it, it's talking, of course, to Christians. He's saying it's ridiculous for you to believe that there's no resurrection because, well, Christ has been raised for starters, and we know that. And uh, so therefore there must be resurrection. But if Christ hasn't been raised, then actually all that we're doing, everything we do as Christians is completely worthless. We, well, we'll just pack up and go home. Uh, forget it. Uh, your faith is useless. We're wasting our lives. But there's the truth. A future resurrection. Verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. The NIV says he is the first fruits, the first of a great harvest of all who've died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. After that, the end will come when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For the scriptures say, God has put all things under his authority. I just want to notice something here, okay? This is a little, this sort of just wrong with me a bit this, this week. Is there's going to be a resurrection because Jesus is the first fruits, okay? There is going to be a resurrection. You are going to be raised. There's coming a day when you are going to be raised. But you see, that is brings in the end. He says, after that, the end will come and he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler, authority and power. Uh, and it, this, this ties in with the song which we, we sang earlier. You know, I speak the name of Jesus. I speak the name of Jesus over addictions, over, uh, over depression, over anxiety, and all, all these things are things that trouble us because Jesus is victorious. And the thing is this, is what Jesus is doing right now is he is gaining the victory. What we read in this section is that Jesus is defeating every enemy of his. Everything which is opposed to Jesus, everything that is opposed to the name of Jesus, Jesus, everything that is opposed to the things that he brings, Jesus is defeating. And he is doing it in this age before the end. Because when the end comes, at the end of this age, he's going to hand over everything else having been defeated to the Father. He's handing the kingdom back, it says, to the Father. That's interesting, isn't it? What Jesus is doing right now. And we see it, we see it in that testimony we saw on the video earlier of a lady who's, who becomes addicted to heroin and she can't get rid of it. You can't get rid of your addictions very easily at all. It's nigh on impossible. But there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the gospel. And we are humbled before him and as we acknowledge his name, he sets us free. And that's the way in which Jesus is conquering the power of the evil one even in this very age. And having conquered those things, the ultimate victory that Jesus is going to achieve is this. He's going to achieve victory over death. God brings life. Sin and the evil one bring death. That's where it comes from. And Jesus is going to be victorious over that too. And that is going to be an obvious victory when we are all raised from the dead. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Hallelujah. What a saviour. That's what Jesus is going to do. Yeah, do you believe it? Oh, yeah. Do you know you hold of this? Yeah, excellent moment. Yeah. Love you, my man. Yeah. That's good. Yo, oh, yes. Yeah, isn't that fantastic? Okay? That is wonderful news. It's gospel truth. It's what the scriptures proclaim. And after that, after every enemy is destroyed, Jesus has accomplished everything that he set out to do. 
It starts as he came into this world and he humbles himself and becomes in that stable a little baby. And he grows up and he lives a pure and holy life. And as he goes to that cross, and on the cross, as he stands condemned in our place, he makes the way. And hence he's able to say, I am the way, the truth and the life. And that is what he's now accomplishing. And he's gone to the right hand of the Father. And he sits there right now. And he sent his Holy Spirit. And his Holy Spirit is exercising that power in our hearts and our minds today. His kingdom is being established. It has gone not just in Palestine, but it has gone global. It is right throughout the world today. Christians on every continent. Christians probably in every country. Almost every tribe and nation has someone who's following him in it. And it's you and I. And we have our own little story of what Jesus Christ has been accomplishing in our lives as he has changed us from people who have been opposed to God and his ways. And he's brought us into his family as he's taken away our sins. And as he's changed us and transformed us, as that lady said on the video earlier, her life is different to what it used to be. And when this is all complete, when he's fully accomplished in you, what he desires to complete in you, which is that you might be perfect, that you might be like Christ. That's what he's doing in your life now. And even in death, he's going to be doing that. Even in death, he's going to be doing that. Because in death, you're going to go down and you're going to come back up, raised to new life. It's not to be fearful about it. What? <laughs> <laughs> Something to go for. Yeah. <laughs> the truth. A future resurrection. Christ is raised from the dead. And he's the first fruits of it. He's the start of that harvest. So, that has an impact on us now, says Paul. Uh, why should we say, this is the point you say, if there's no resurrection, if there's none of that future, why should we risk our lives hour by hour for I swear dear brothers and sisters that I face death daily this as certain as my pride in what Christ Jesus our Lord has done in you and what value was there in fighting wild beasts those people of Ephesus if there be, will be no resurrection from the dead and if there's no resurrection let's feast and drink for tomorrow we die don't be fooled by those who say such things for bad company corrupts good character Think carefully about what is right and stop sinning. For to your shame, I say that some of you don't know God at all. What an indictment on some of those Christians in that church. How well do we know God? How well do we know what he is doing? It is shown by the way in which we live our lives. For Paul, he so understood who God was and what he was doing that he was ready to, to lay his life down day by day as he took the risks of proclaiming the gospel in the different towns he went to. And you can read about it in Acts, for example. He literally risked his life on many occasions. On one occasion he was stoned and left for dead. But our Heavenly Father watches over us and he cares for us. And as we take those risks for him, he can protect us and bring us through. Just think of Shradrach, Meshach and Abednego in the fiery furnace as they declared that they would not bow down to the God of that age that they were told to bow down to. They refused. Even if you throw us into the fiery furnace, we will not bow down and worship because our God is able to save us. But even if he doesn't, we will still not bow down and worship this. We will still worship our God. Your God is able, your God is able to bring you through whatever you face because of your witness and you declaring the gospel. Wow. So there's a resurrection. But how's that going to happen? Because really, to be honest, my, my body's... But it fades away, doesn't it? We're, we're, all, we're all getting older. So, someone may ask, how will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? What a foolish question. I mean, Paul doesn't mince his words, does he? When you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. And what you put in the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a bare seed of wheat 
or whatever you were planting. Then God gives it the new body he wants it to have. A different plant grows from each kind of seed. Similarly, there are different kinds of flesh. One kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. In, in verse 42, it is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They're buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. The scripture tells us the first man, Adam, became a living person. But the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body, then the spiritual body comes later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man, and heavenly people are like the heavenly man. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. The truth of the matter is, is the body you now have is not the body you will have in eternity. That's, that's, that's pretty obvious in many ways when you think about what happens to our bodies when we die. You can see there a little table of the opposites. Uh, I've used the NIV words there. Sown perishable. Our bodies are just, they die. That's the way it is. But you will be raised imperishable. Sown in dishonour. Uh, so often, isn't it? Actually, death is, is humiliating. It kind of doesn't really, you know, it's, quite, it really, it's, it's, it's horrible, isn't it? For many people, the process of death is actually really horrible. But they will be raised, those who follow in Christ, will be raised in glory. They'll be sown weak. Can we get, those of you who are young, getting stronger, but those of us who are older are getting weaker. Sown in weakness, but raised in power. You're just a natural body you're in at the moment. But it'll be some spiritual body, as the word Paul uses here. It'll be some, it's, it's like the body of Christ. As we look at the resurrected Christ, there's something, it's both physical, but somehow it's beyond the physical of our realm. He's able to go through walls and those sort of things, isn't it? I don't, I don't, I, I don't have a full scientific understanding of it. I can only take what the scriptures say about it. But it is something which is going to be phenomenal and amazing. We are going to be of heaven and in the image of the heavenly man that is Christ. So when is this going to happen? Well, at the end time, verse 50. What I'm saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be just like twinkling of an eye. Instant. You're going to be transformed for heaven. Whether you've died in the meantime or you're still alive when he comes. I don't know which that is. But you'll be transformed in an instant. And at that moment, death 
will have been fully defeated. There will be no more mourning in heaven, no more crying, no more pain. We've been set free from all those things which so torment us in this life. They will be no more. Fully defeated, Christ's kingdom fully accomplished. Verse 58, so my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. The NIV says stand firm. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord. For the no you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Let's just conclude. Jesus is risen from the dead. Therefore, we know that there is a future resurrection. You and I live this life on earth for just a very limited time. Very, very limited. However long, even if you live to be the longest living person in this age, say 120, so it's so limited compared to eternity. This is nothing. Jesus Christ calls us to live in the light of eternity, to live for eternity. My friends, are we living for ourselves? Are we living for this life? Or are we living for the life which is to come? That has wide-ranging implications. It's about the priorities we give to the things around us day by day. What's most important in your life? Always work enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. In this life, we can build all sorts of things. We can build buildings, we can make cars, we can build technological things, we can plant gardens, we can um, do all sorts of stuff. But it all only lasts for a limited time. It really does. Don't it? it doesn't take, uh, if you've got a garden, it doesn't take long to lack the care and it, we do take it over, don't it? It's a nightmare. When you think of buildings, I mean, just look at the building out here. And, you know, it, it, it corrodes with time. It falls apart with time. You look at companies and businesses and say, they rise and then they fall. You know, we look at the great businesses of the coming age. We look at each of us as individuals and we can achieve things and accomplishments. But actually, over time, those disappear once again. And actually the only thing that lasts forever is what we truly do for the Lord. For the Lord. Now that doesn't mean that you don't go to work anymore, you don't go to school anymore. Yeah? <laughs> but it does mean that you go working for the Lord there enthusiastically. You go into your workplace, your school place, or whatever social place it is, with the mindset of I am working for the Lord. And what that means is, is I'm going to work in his way. Whether it's doing my homework or doing whatever the boss has said. I'm going to work in God's way. And when we work in God's way, we will find actually that God works through us and brings eternal consequences to it. And often that will mean is that I will be astutely aware of where the Holy Spirit is wanting to speak and bring gospel truth into situation two. And sometimes that's going to cost us. And I suggest that in the coming days that's going to cost us more than it has done in the decades past. But the reality is that we and I 
you and I, we, believe in the resurrection of the dead. We believe in eternity. And we, right now, are working enthusiastically for the Lord. And that will never be in vain. Have you ever, you ever been in the workplace and you, you've done something and it's just like undone and you just feel like you're banging your head against a brick wall? Have you ever felt like you're banging your head against a brick wall? It might be in your homes, running your family as parents, okay? It might be in your school workplace, you just feel like you can never get the grades the teacher's wanting. It might be in the workplace and you know, you, you're just constantly fighting against different issues and problems. Yeah, anybody feel that? Anybody feel that? Yeah? Nobody's putting their hand up, you're all just too frustrated to put your hand up. I can kind of see in your faces a bit of, yeah, I've got a bit of that, yeah? Yeah. The teacher's running the classrooms and the kids just don't, you know, it's, it's like that, isn't it? Yeah? Life's like that. You can so often feel in vain. But this says working for the Lord is never in vain. Working for the Lord is never in vain. Yes, yeah, sometimes we're still going to bang our heads a bit, you know, what's going on? But we can hold God's promise that he will bring what is good and last forever. Got a sore head there. <laughs> Let's just pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, I just thank you that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Lord, we want to celebrate that. And Lord, I thank you that you give us that assurance in our hearts by your Holy Spirit too that that is true, and that we are your children. Just come Holy Spirit, I pray for any here now who don't feel that deep assurance. Lord, bring that assurance, we pray. Just touch each one. May we know, deep down, that's what you're doing. And Lord, as we just consider this, this matter too, Lord, Lord, we're, we're challenged in in terms of us enthusiastically working for the Lord. Lord, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you'd, you'd fill us with that enthusiasm, Lord, with that passion, with that priority, that we seek to honour you above everything else, to work for you above everything else. Lord, help us to be ready to set other things aside, that your will will be done. Lord, we don't want to let other things get in the way at all. Forgive us, Lord for where our priorities have been different. And Lord, I want to pray for each one here too, Lord. Lord, I pray for each of us as we go out from here into the workplace, into uh, society, into our homes. Lord, may we truly live for you. May we live for you, Lord. May we shine brightly for you, Lord. Lord, may others see clearly that you are first in our lives, above everything else, and nothing else matters. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Great. Thank you, guys. Lead us in our last song.